Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. So my name is Emily Dodwell. I'm a director of inventive science in the data science and AI research organization at AT&T within our chief data office. So I'll be talking this evening about four lessons that I took away from my first career as a high school math teacher and how I still think about those in the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis within our organization. And I think they're also pretty representative of the way that AT&T has approached this generative AI space. So right out of college, I became a high school math teacher at one of the top boarding schools in the United States. When you're teaching at a boarding school, you're what they call a triple threat. You have to teach, advise, and you coach. I was never particularly athletically inclined, um, and so I became the coach of the JV math team. I had been a math major undergrad and absolutely loved um, you know, exposing students to new challenges and, and new types of problems. Um, so this was a really good fit for me. So when you're on a math team, you're essentially preparing for competitions with other high school students, both locally and nationally. And so the problems that math competitions see include uh, various fields of math, including number theory, probability, deductive reasoning, there's advanced geometry and algebra. And the problems are pretty tough. They are often um, have multiple ways that you can approach the solution. Um, they are pretty creative solutions and oftentimes rather unintuitive. So the students that joined the math team at the school where I was teaching were whip smart. So after my first few you know, sessions with them of our, our practices, essentially, um, I'll admit it, I was pretty intimidated. How do I make these really bright students even smarter? And so I confided this feeling in a mentor of mine, and his words have stayed with me to this day. He said, you don't have to be smarter than your students. You just have to be more prepared. And so initially, in my 22-year-old panic, I thought that meant that I had to solve and memorize every possible solution to these problems. And I realized that with my other responsibilities of teaching and advising, that just wouldn't be possible. So I took a pretty significant step back and just thought about what it meant to be prepared in this situation. What they really needed for me was an opportunity to work together on challenging problems that they weren't going to see in the classroom, and the opportunity and space to think about them together. So they just needed a, a thoughtfully curated set of problems here. They didn't need me to be at the front of the room dazzling them with my mathematical wit and creativity, but rather really just the opportunity to see stuff they weren't going to. There was no expectation of a grade. There was an opportunity to be wrong, to be not sure. Um, and also, though, to experience together those aha moments that I still think to this day make math such a wonderful subject. And so teamwork, collaboration, the critical thinking, these were all really important takeaways from their time on the math team. They also needed me to help them identify the right tools to solve one of these challenging problems. And so what could that mean? So for some of the probability problems, making it tangible, giving them dice that they could throw and just sort of think through that um, in a, in a you know, physical way, really. And then also sometimes, you know, you can brute force. Counting problems can be pretty tricky. You can brute force a solution, and then you can also generalize it with variables. So they really just need me to make those connections for them and help them employ some of the tools in my teaching toolkit to solving these JV math team problems. I was also really thoughtful about the students that I grouped together as they were practicing problems. So thinking through what classes were they taking, what grades were they in, was someone more social um, or shyer. And you really want to make a, a diverse set of students in those environments. You often hear that teaching is one of the most effective forms of learning. Um, and so also giving students an opportunity to present their solution was a really valuable way for them to think through or see other um, aspects of a problem. And finally, staying curious. So I, was, I finally got to the place where I could tell them, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. Let's figure it out together. Um, and that became such a powerful tool in my toolkit because it enabled us to sort of think through something together. I didn't have to be the smartest person in that room, and I didn't have to try to be. It was really all about that preparation. So the success that we went on to have together, we placed first in the Greater New Haven Math League for two consecutive years that I was teaching them. We also took part in the American Mathematics Competition and the New England Math League. Um, and I also got to take them to the Harvard-MIT Math Tournament, which is one of the most prestigious and competitive math tournaments for high school students in the country. I think for me, the, the greatest lesson I took away from this was that empowering people um, and enabling them to you know, get, get these successes to these outcomes was really a, a powerful thing and something that I've taken away in my career at AT&T.
So you may be thinking, well, what does the JV Math team have to do with the work that I do now at AT&T, and what the heck does it have to do with generative AI? Um, fair questions. <laughs> I think that I now consider myself very lucky um, to work in an organization where I'm certainly not the smartest person in the room. And so I often go back when I'm encountering a, a situation or a challenge I haven't seen before. I go back to those words of advice. You don't have to be the smartest. You just have to be prepared. And so what does that mean for me now? I've been a director within the company for a little over a year. Um, and I think about those four pieces, those four tools and lessons um, when I'm approaching how I lead my team. So I want to make sure that I know what really matters to them. What do they want for their career? What do they care about personally? What motivates them? And connecting that to our business unit partner priorities and the business outcomes that we're looking to achieve. As far as the tools, I want to make sure that they have professional development opportunities, that they are staying on top of the latest technologies, and that we're meeting them where they are with that training, that it's not one size fits all. I think those are all pieces that come together really beautifully when you're trying to work with a team um, and making sure that people are feeling appreciated and also, you know, progressing in their career. I think, too, I often think about, like, what problems could we be solving that no one has explicitly asked of us, but that we think would have business value? And that's that curiosity piece, and I love that I get to bring that to my job every day. So the same framework also applies as we've been taking on generative AI and um, you know, thinking about what comes next in the technology frontier. And I think the company is doing this really well, too. So what are we looking to do with Gen AI? I mean, I think that there's a thoughtful preparation and execution that needs to happen to ensure that we're doing that well. And I think AT&T has been navigating this very successfully. So we're innovating on the ways that we interact with information, both internally and externally. Um, we want to improve the customer experience, and we also want to identify opportunities for increased employee productivity. So some of the early use cases that we have been exploring with Gen AI include things like enabling customer care agents to have better and more powerful search um, when they're working with a customer over the phone. Internally, it's meant that we now have tools that can summarize meetings and phone calls to make that more efficient. You know, you think about all the notes that you used to take, and now you plop it into our summarization tool, and now you have a beautiful you know, representation of a meeting. We're also using Gen AI to upgrade legacy code to newer environments, which has been really valuable as well. How are we doing this? Well, in our toolkit, um, the team has been developing what we call Ask at and so this is AT&T's version of ChatGPT4 functionality um, in partnership with Microsoft. So we have a private endpoint that enables us to use this technology in a safe way, and there is not that risk of leakage into the public domain that can be so damaging. We're also training this in a deliberate way. So thinking about accurate, responsible responses that are thorough and making sure that that's communicating what we need. Um, so all of that is going into this platform that's currently under development. As far as connecting the right people, you want to make sure that you're you know, deploying and developing AI in a responsible way. And this is where we have a generative AI council that brings together leaders from across the company. This includes legal, privacy, business unit leadership to make sure that they're representing the priorities of the business, um, as well as the platform architects and data scientists that are using it. And together, they're evaluating every use case that comes in across the company to make sure that we are taking a 360-degree view of how this tool is being used. They're making sure then that we're employing it in a way that is um, consistent with our AI policy and operating guidelines. And finally, that curiosity piece that I think is what gets me excited about coming to work every day. AT&T has a phenomenal history of innovation and invention. I originally joined labs when I joined the company, and some of my colleagues were former Bell Labs inventors, um, which is a really special environment to be in, and that culture still you know, persists within our organization. So as we continue exploring you know, the power and the limitations of this technology, I think that opportunity for ongoing research, both of the platform as well as the use cases and things that we can tackle with it, um, I'm really excited about. And I think you know, keeping together these four pieces, these four lessons, is very much how I think about my job and, and connected back to my day's teaching. So thank you so much for your time this evening. It's been a real pleasure.